Welcome to the High Performance Liquid Chromatography New User Orientation video. All undergraduate and graduate student users of an HPLC housed within the Chemistry Department at Towson University are required to watch this video. The overarching goal of this video is to provide you with information that is important to keeping you and the instrument safe. Specifically, we will provide an overview of HPLC and then we will explain policies and expectations applicable to all HPLC users. We will also highlight best practices in terms of safety and waste management. And finally, we will explain how to avoid mistakes that can damage the instruments. This video does not represent all the training you will need in order to independently operate an HPLC. For example, this video does not cover how to navigate the HPLC software packages, how to develop an appropriate HPLC method, or how to repair broken HPLCs. Let's begin with a brief overview of HPLC. HPLC is commonly used to separate analytes within liquid samples. HPLC can also be used to quantify the concentrations of each component within such mixtures. The diagram shown on the screen is a schematic of the important components of an HPLC. At the beginning of the diagram are one or more solvents, which are pressurized by a pump. The solvents make up what is called the mobile phase. A small volume of sample is injected into the pressurized mobile phase. The flow of the mobile phase then carries the sample to the HPLC column where ideally all analytes of interest are separated so that each analyte is released from the column during a separate time segment. After exiting the column, analytes pass through the detector which generates a signal as a function of the concentration of each analyte. After passing through the detector, the analytes and the mobile phase are collected in a waste container. In order to save bench space, modern HPLC instruments are configured with stackable components. This picture illustrates a typical HPLC system manufactured by Agilent. The solvent bottles are placed in a secondary container which rests on top of the pump. The stack of components on the left hand side includes an auto sampler, where sample vials are housed, a column compartment, and one or more detectors. Each component of the HPLC is powered on and off separately. Each component communicates to a computer through software that can vary from one instrument to the next. Your research advisor will assist you in learning how to use the software specific to the HPLC assigned to your group. Next we'll examine the policies and expectations applicable to all HPLC users. All student HPLC users must complete a new student user form, which is available from your research advisor. The form can also be obtained from any analytical chemistry faculty member. To complete the top part of the form, enter your full name, your standing as either undergraduate or graduate, the anticipated month and year of your graduation from TU, the full name of your research advisor, and a brief description of your research topic. If your project requires the use of specific research space within the UEBL, check all the space needs that apply to your project. Consult with your advisor if you are unsure. At the bottom of the form, check all the instruments that you may need in order to complete your project. The focus of this video is on the HPLC instruments with diode array detectors, so don't forget to check this box. On the second page of the form, please paste a head and shoulders picture of yourself. Completed forms should be submitted via email to your research advisor. Prior to using an HPLC, users are required to reserve the instrument using the Towson Core page at bookmylab.com. Authorized users will be given permission to access this site after all training requirements are satisfied. The Towson Core site is used to reserve instrument time for all shared instruments housed within the Department of Chemistry and the Urban Environmental Biogeochemistry Laboratory at Towson University. After you log in to Book My Lab, you'll come to a page that looks like this. You can select the date in which you want to make a reservation by clicking on the calendar and then selecting the appropriate date. On the left-hand side is a list of all of the instruments within the Towson Core facility. If, for example, you wanted to reserve the HPLC that's an Agilent 1200 model in Smith 513, 
on Thursday, February 9th from 11 a.m. until 3 p.m., you can simply click on the appropriate time and select book. That'll bring you to a page that says schedules add new record. At this point, you can confirm that the instrument choice is correct, that the date is correct, and that the start and end time of your reservation is correct. If you are a student user, in the comments section, please add the last name of your faculty advisor and then click save. Reservations for instrument time should be made at least one day, but no more than two weeks in advance, with the exception of faculty members who are reserving instruments for laboratory courses. Use of the Book My Lab online scheduling system helps to minimize scheduling conflicts. However, if a scheduling conflict arises, teaching laboratories are given priority for instrument use over research activities. Use of logbooks is essential for the proper documentation and upkeep of all analytical instruments, including HPLCs. Prior to each analysis, HPLC users must enter, at a minimum, the date, username, research advisor's name, number of samples analyzed, composition of mobile phase, and column type into the logbook. Now let's consider best practices concerning safety and waste management. Using an HPLC is not without hazards to the safety of operators and other occupants of the associated laboratory space. Recommended personal protective equipment for HPLC users includes protective eyewear, nitrile gloves, and a lab coat. Wearing personal protective equipment is particularly important when you are handling solvents and changing columns. Wearing gloves during these procedures protects your hands from the chemicals and minimizes the risk of contaminating the solvents or the column with oils and bacteria on your skin. Note, however, that gloves should be removed before using the computer keyboard or mouse. Consult with your research advisor if you have any safety-related questions. Be sure to check the level of the mobile phase waste in the waste container before turning on the HPLC pump. The waste bottle must be stored in a secondary container. If the waste bottle is more than 80% full, empty the bottle into the bulk waste container before beginning your analysis. When uncapping waste containers, take care not to kink the tubing. A good procedure is to hold the cap and tubing stationary while rotating the bottle until the cap is released from the bottle. To maximize efficiency and increase user aptitude, you are required to use the single HPLC assigned to your research group. Ask your research advisor to show you the HPLC assigned to your group. Any exceptions to this policy must be authorized in advance by an analytical chemistry faculty member. Next, let's consider some important steps you can take to minimize the risk of damaging the HPLC assigned to your group. When you install an HPLC column, be careful not to exert any unnecessary strain on the metal tubing leading to the inlet side of the column. This metal tubing can snap if kinked or strained. All HPLC columns are marked with the correct mobile phase flow direction. Be sure to connect the column accordingly. Care should be taken to remove particles from all samples analyzed by HPLC. Particles can clog and damage the instrument's components. The best way to minimize damage due to particles is to pass all samples through a syringe filter with a pore size of 0.45 microns or less. After loading samples in the auto sampler tray, be sure the tray is seated properly in the instrument. If the tray is not properly seated, the instrument will not permit you to start an analysis. An all too common mistake for HPLC users is running out of solvent. This is problematic because if a solvent level gets too low, the instrument will begin to pump air instead of solvent. Pumping air can damage columns and create flow obstructions in other parts of the instrument. Before beginning a batch of samples on an HPLC, it's important to estimate the total amount of solvent that you will need to complete that batch. You should use this equation to obtain a conservative estimate of the amount of solvent needed to analyze a batch of samples. I recommend a safety factor of 1.2, which corresponds to a 20% excess. This excess accounts for the fact that the pumps are pumping mobile phase in between each sample as well as during the analysis of each sample. I also recommend that you add 100 milliliters of extra solvent to ensure that the solvent levels never fall below the height of the inlet tubes. If a user wants to analyze a batch of 88 samples, each injected one time, 
using a method that requires six minutes of analysis time per sample, a total mobile phase flow rate of 0.7 milliliters per minute, and a mobile phase that is fixed at 60% water and 40% methanol, we can use the equation shown above to estimate the needed volume of water and methanol. Let's begin by calculating the volume of water required to complete this entire batch of samples. We can insert the given values into our equation. The equation predicts that we will need to begin the analysis with at least 366 milliliters of water in the water bottle. If we repeat the calculation for methanol, we find that 277 milliliters of methanol should be present in the methanol bottle before we start the analysis. I should caution that additional solvent volume is typically needed in order to equilibrate the column prior to injecting any samples. Solvent bottles are stored in secondary containers above the HPLC pumps. Quaternary HPLC pumps can draw from up to four solvent bottles simultaneously. Each solvent bottle is connected to tubing that is designated as either line A, B, C, or D. Let's say your method relies on methanol and water. If your HPLC method assumes that methanol is connected to line B and water is connected to line A, make sure that these connections are accurate. Another user might have switched the bottles around prior to you using the instrument. Also make sure each solvent bottle needed for your analysis has at least as much solvent as indicated in your previous calculations. In addition to the solvents used for the mobile phase, each HPLC has a separate solvent bottle that the instrument uses to perform the needle wash. Methanol is typically used for the needle wash. Before each run, check to ensure that there is at least 100 milliliters of solvent in the needle wash bottle. When changing solvents, bottles that were previously used to contain aqueous solutions should only be used to contain aqueous solutions. Similarly, bottles previously used to contain organic solvents should only be used to contain organic solvents. This approach helps to prevent the possible precipitation of mobile phase additives such as buffer salts. The contents of a solvent bottle must be completely and clearly labeled on the bottle. Keep in mind that aqueous solutions can rather quickly become contaminated with bacteria and algae when stored for more than a few days at room temperature. As such, aqueous solutions should be completely replaced on a regular basis. To help all users keep track of the age of mobile phase components, please record the refill date on the bottle for all aqueous solutions. For your safety and the safety of the instrument, remove solvent bottles from their typical position above the pumps and set them on a lab bench away from the instrument and away from computers when pouring solvents. All solvents used for HPLC analyses must be HPLC grade. Water must be obtained from a water polisher, such as the NanoPure system shown. All organic solvents must be labeled as either HPLC grade or LCMS grade. Prior to starting an analysis, be sure to check the lines from the solvent bottles for air bubbles. If air bubbles are allowed to reach the column, column performance can deteriorate. If you see any bubbles in the lines between the solvent bottles and the pump, open the pump purge valve by rotating counterclockwise one half turn. After you open the purge valve a half turn, solvent will flow from the pump directly to the waste container without passing through the column or any detectors. Keep the purge valve open until all air bubbles pass through the pump. This may take several minutes. It is the responsibility of individual users to ensure that the instrument is properly and promptly shut down at the conclusion of each batch. Users should estimate the total time it will take the instrument to process their entire batch and then check on the instrument promptly at or near the end of the analysis. If your method includes a mobile phase with a buffer additive such as formic acid, acetic acid, or phosphate salts, you must flush the system with pure water in place of the buffer solution at the end of each batch for at least two minutes. For example, if your mobile phase is composed of 40% methanol and 60% water containing 0.1% formic acid, at the end of each batch, you must flush the system with 40% methanol and 60% pure water. Doing so removes the buffer additive from the system. This is important because buffer additives can corrode the metallic components of the instrument. 
Additional essential shutdown steps include turning off the pump, turning off the lamp, removing sample vials from the auto sampler tray, and removing your column. If any performance issues occur during your use of an HPLC, be sure to record the details of these issues in the logbook. Be sure to report these details to your research advisor. Research advisors are responsible, in turn, for relaying any performance or safety issues to the analytical coordinator and the FCSM lab manager. Let's summarize some of the best practices for using the HPLCs. Be sure to make reservations in advance using bookmylab.com. Completely fill out the logbook each time you use an instrument. Ensure prompt and proper instrument shutdown. The next scheduled user should not have to remove your sample vials or column. Do not run out of solvent. In other words, do not allow the instrument to pump air. And of course, follow all safety guidelines, including the appropriate use of personal protective equipment. The analytical coordinator may impose any of the following remedial actions against users who do not adhere to the user guidelines discussed in this video. Such remedial actions can include required additional training prior to future use, required presence of a more experienced user and or research advisor, for future HPLC experiments, and suspension or revocation of user privileges. Before you can independently operate an HPLC, additional training beyond the content covered in this video is required. Your research advisor is responsible for providing training on topics such as sample preparation, navigating HPLC software programs, HPLC method development, data collection, storage, and analysis. For additional information or questions related to HPLC use, consult with your research advisor, an analytical chemistry faculty member, or the FCSM lab manager. Prior to being authorized to reserve instrument time and perform independent experiments, the following steps must be completed. You must email a completed copy of the UEBL new user form to your research advisor. You must meet with your research advisor to schedule hands-on instrument training. You must ask your research advisor to forward your new user form via email to the analytical coordinator and the FCSM lab manager. In this email, your research advisor must certify that hands-on training has occurred. Thank you for your efforts to keep our shared instrument resources in top shape. This concludes this video.